The liturgy for the dead is an Easter liturgy. It finds all its meaning in the resurrection. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we too shall be raised. The liturgy, therefore, is characterized by joy in the certainty that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. This joy, however, does not make human grief unchristian. The very love we have for each other in Christ brings deep sorrow when we are parted by death. Jesus himself wept at the grave of his friend. So while we rejoice that one we love has entered into the presence of our Lord, we sorrow in sympathy with those who mourn. Most merciful God, whose wisdom is beyond our understanding, deal graciously with Gary's loved ones in their grief. Surround them with your love, that they may not be overwhelmed by their loss, but have confidence in your goodness and strength to meet the days to come. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I am the resurrection. I am the life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, even though he dies. And everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth after my awakening, he will raise me up, and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see, and my eyes behold him, who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself, and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord, and if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. 
in the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died, and in their departure is thought to be a disaster. And their going from us is said to be their destruction, but they are at peace. For though in the sight of others they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good, because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Those who trust in him will understand the truth, and the faithful will abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are upon the Holy One. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. We'll read together Psalm 23.
and you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In our reading today from the Wisdom of Solomon, hopefully you can see how in God's earliest covenant and in the inspired words of those following God with all their heart, steadfast in prayer and listening attentively, that the Spirit of God was among them and that all that was necessary to understand and be ready for the coming of Christ was laid before us. And you can look at it with a sense of confidence in your head, and you can also look at it from a sense of trust in God, but if we're honest with ourselves, only in a few, perhaps, glory-filled moments are we not right there with Thomas saying, I, I like seeing you, and I'd like to see you. I don't want to talk about you being away from me. And this place you're talking about, it's not familiar to me. I don't want that. If, if I have any say, I'd like things to just stay the way they are, Jesus. Stay here with us and don't go anywhere. And faith is the invitation that Jesus asks us to embrace. And we can trust we can hopefully feel, too, when we're gathered in the name of the Lord in this beautiful place or elsewhere, that it is true that Jesus is among us when we gather in his name. And by the power of the Spirit, we can know and feel that deep within us. But it's not as easy and as relaxing as knowing things is. We can sit with that debate for a great deal of time, and many people find that to be a very difficult struggle that keeps them even distant from a faith community. I feel very blessed that someone who didn't let that become a barrier was among the people I got to know pretty well, Gary. Gary was excited to be alive. Gary was smart and focused on what he knew. And Gary was happy to talk about what he didn't know and glad to have the opportunity to learn from anyone who came into his presence. I, I, I got to know Gary a little bit before I came here, he was discerning uh, becoming a minister and studying at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And right around the corner, not too far, is a cafe called Zeke's. And sometimes I'd walk in there and meet someone there, and he'd kind of be holding court in there, eating lots of sweet things with icing on them. And through that sound of the, the whatever was in his mouth, he was still able to make sure everybody could understand the point he was trying to make. And everybody was glad. I could tell that there were other students who were listening and engaged, and he, he wasn't being bossy, but his wisdom and the joy of his heart was drawing people to him. And I always enjoyed uh, talking with him here and there in practical matters and in just relaxing, casual ones. And in, in either case, if it was something I was concerned about that I wanted his advice on, or if it was just kind of shooting the breeze at coffee hour, either way, he was open 
and content. He wasn't arrogant. He wasn't suspicious. He was radiating with Christian love. When I was interviewing for the position here as priest at St. Stephen's, he was on the committee, and I remember him asking me, so, can you tell us a little bit about the difference of the hat you wear in therapy versus the hat you'll wear in pastoral ministry? And I thought it was so wise, and I learned later in talking with him, it just sort of rolled off naturally from his training in human resources. But he afforded me the opportunity to share with the committee. It was not a question just merely from his curiosity. It was a question that enabled him to facilitate his role as a member of that search committee that I could discuss with them, that I wasn't going to be quote unquote psychoanalyzing everybody each time I had a confrontation with them or a question, and that the liturgy would be priestly, not therapeutic. And I think it's really important that you know that I reached out to Gary on a couple of occasions when I needed some human resources advice. He was filled with wisdom. And he had lots of experience to share. And he guided me to make one of the most difficult decisions I had to make, and I used him, I consulted with him, and he was happy to be a part of it, both in what he shared and in what he asked me. And I was able to feel much more confident in my decision as a result of his interest, his willingness to be a part of our time together. I know many things about Gary recently from prayerfully talking with Stephen. And they are perhaps some of the things that many of you already probably know. A couple things might be really helpful for you to understand. But I'd also like to focus first and foremost on the way that Stephen lived his life with joy and peace, with confidence and ease, with humility and contentment, was a direct result of his love of Jesus. Each of us has an opportunity every day to either be drawn into the sacred scriptures of our church, to be drawn into the invitation of our liturgy, or to be resistant to it. We have to make a choice. Thomas was struggling to make that choice, and if we're honest, we struggle to make that choice also. I think that for anyone who makes a life transition, it requires a great deal of faith. Gary was, for over 14 years in the Bay Area, working with Wells Fargo in Human Resources and then with uh, another bank, Chase, in Tucson, Arizona. And then for the past seven years, he was here as a student. And through that whole journey, he was 27 years with his husband, Stephen. We rejoice that God drew them to be a part of our parish family. And Gary sat right in the front, ready to help, to carry the cross or do whatever. And he also liked to be really close to the microphone so that he could share something that was inspiring to him, to everybody, when the time came in the middle of the liturgy. And then afterwards, I don't think he ever missed, I don't remember him ever saying, I, I can only stay for the liturgy, I'm not going to hang out and visit with everybody at coffee hour. He was always there. And I could rely on, even when things kind of quieted down, a chance to chat with Stephen Gary then. It must have been odd to go from growing up in Queens, New York, to a 
the other side of the country and to go through all the ups and downs of his life. And for many people, being diagnosed as HIV positive could have been a reason to feel that God let me suffer or that God gave me something more than I should have had to bear or fill in the blank reason why I'm bitter, reason why I'm going to be really standoffish with people and withdrawn. And far from it, he was proud of every aspect of his life, being openly gay early when it was pretty, pretty dangerous for your career to do so, and to live his life without anything but an openness to, to share his story so that other people could share their story. And I would invite you to see how important it is that being a disciple of Jesus is an invitation for us to follow in that path, a path that leads to an open mind, a childlike spirit, a trust that God is with us, not measuring God's love by worldly possessions or health or strength, but focusing on the kingdom of God. At the end of his life, John, in this revelation, our epistle lesson for today, he continues, he, he's filled with faith, he's steadfast as a disciple of Jesus from the time he's called early in his life until the very end when he is in exile on the island of Patmos, when God inspires him to write these words, as we believe, from the beginning to the end. If you look at the first thing John writes, Referring to Jesus in the beginning was the Word, the eternal Word of God, who becomes incarnate and dwells among us. The very beginning, everything we could know about time is all in the hands of the Word of God, the eternal Word of God, through whom the universe is made. And at the end, the, the, toward the end of this book of Revelation, the same John is reminding us that Jesus reminds him to tell us that he is the beginning and the end, that all things have their conclusion. Our earthly existence and all of creation will have its completion in Christ. You might not know it, just a little bit of trivia on either side of the high altar. It's a traditional Christian symbol using these words. Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, the text from which things were written back then, the first letter of the alphabet, Omega the last, on either side of the cross, above the high altar, is a reference to this scriptural text. Jesus is our beginning and our end, and Jesus asks us to trust that the Spirit of God whom he sends into the world will be with us on our journey. I'd like to say that if, if any of us who would have our pick, we'd be right there with Thomas and say, I wish I could see heaven, even if it's just a couple minutes. I, I really want to see it now. I'd like to know for sure, with my own human eyes, that it's there, that it's real. And Jesus asks us to dig deep and to stay together, to abide in God's love, and to stay close to one another instead, so that instead of just knowing with our human eyes, we'll know by faith. And frankly, God also invites us to see that anything else is really an illusion. It's temporary and it's passing. Some people are not born with human eyes and sight. We are not promised that we'll stay strong and healthy our whole life. We are promised that we're not going to get sick. We are promised that the people we love aren't going to have accidents and get hurt and get sick. This is not our home. We are children of God and we are pilgrims on a journey here. We are called to wait well for God's return. 
And so I'd like to kind of take a moment for us to remember with the natural smile that has to come to your face when you think of Gary, that being at peace with God looks like something. Praying regularly looks like something. Being somebody who studies scripture, it, it has its effect. And that effect is that you're open to more things. You're not clinging or bragging or comparing yourself. You're loving, first and foremost. And you're filled with gratitude to the one who has given everything you can be grateful for. Trusting that things will come and go. Youth passes away. I made a mistake in my first week or two. It seemed like it was really early. Um, it was Gary Dalton's birthday, but somebody just told me in the sacristy it's Gary's birthday. And so I looked at I, I looked at um, I think I looked at Gary Glasser, and I started inviting us all to sing Happy Birthday. And I don't think he was too happy with me that I got the, the name wrong, that I wasn't uh, encouraging the right birthday. But like anything else, the mistakes of our humanity, the natural ways that we make an effort to do one thing and it doesn't quite come as we thought it would, we're invited to make those moments too. Just like our, our moments when we look at ourselves and wish we could be different or face an illness, whether it's a long-term illness or a sudden unexpected crisis or difficulty, we're called to look at it with our Christian faith. We're called to be patient with one another. We're called to look to the good. If we have an assumption to make about one another, it has to be a positive one. And when someone is unkind or chooses to be cold or hard, Hearted. We're invited to rise above that, to look for a way that we can encourage them to make another choice by loving them in spite of that. And because of the goodness of God to us, we can only have the strength that we need to be joyful and humble and at peace with God if we pray fervently and often and early, if every part of our life is filled with a meditation on the beginning and the end of everything. Our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, through whom we were made and sustained. The Spirit whom Jesus sends among us as the church until Christ returns is our gift. The lasting gift is eternal life. We celebrate that in a powerful way every time we gather for a funeral. We are not saying an eternal goodbye. We are saying, Gary, pray for us until we're all together. We're going to pray that God be merciful to Gary, and we're going to pray with vibrant confidence. We're asking God to bless us with an increase of faith so that the joy of being at peace with one another, content enough to smile, to look people in the eye with a humble curiosity and a respect that leads to building bridges of peace, to being present with one another, making a commitment to be present with one another as disciples. Loving Jesus isn't just a head trip. It has to look like something. And we will be held to account at the end of our life for how we have loved. Accomplishments can be great. They come and go. Gary had many accomplishments. He was very studious, had multiple degrees, including graduate study in Stanford and at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And he never stuck his nose up in the air or looked down on anybody or bragged about that. It was mentioned in passing if it was asked, but what Gary shared most was the fact that he loved people and he loved being alive, and he was grateful for the blessing of faith. He loved St. Stephen's, and his love was kind of contagious. It's enabled all of us to love St. Stephen's a little more. We're gathered as a parish family, and including neighbors and friends of Gary and 
Stephen, and we're making a commitment to one another now to wait well for Christ's return, to support one another with encouragement, to recognize that the things we could brag about in this life are going back. We're going to have to surrender them. And our only real possession is God's love. And the wonderful thing that Gary showed, he understood really well, is love is like a muscle. The more you use it, by God's grace, the more you have to give. Amen. And together let us affirm our faith by the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified and died in his spirit. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life of the Father. As a family of faith, we are bold to say together, Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory forever and ever. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, 
a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, remain with you always. I invite you to join with us in our memorial garden for the final aspect of our liturgy together. Deal graciously with 
Gary's loved ones in their grief. Surround them with your love that they may not be overwhelmed by their loss, but have confidence in your goodness and strength to meet the days to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Oh God bless, we pray. This grave and grant that he whose body is buried here may dwell with Christ in paradise and may come to your heavenly kingdom. We pray you, O oh God, whose blessed Son was laid in the sepulchre in the garden, Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, with whom still live the spirits of those who die in the Lord, and with whom the souls of the faithful are in joy and happiness, we give you heartfelt thanks for the good examples of all your servants who having finished their course in faith now find rest and refreshment. May we, with all who have died in the true faith of your holy name, have perfect fulfillment and bliss in your eternal and everlasting glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. O oh God, whose days are without end and whose mercies cannot be numbered, make us, we pray, deeply aware of the shortness and uncertainty of human life and let your Holy Spirit lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days that when we shall have served you in our generation, we may be gathered to our ancestors, having the testimony of a good conscience in the communion of the Catholic Church, in the confidence of a certain faith, in the comfort of a religious and holy hope, a favor with you, our God, and in perfect charity with the world. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This concludes our liturgy and I'd like to thank everyone who's come. I'd also like to say a little prayer of thanks to God who enabled this to be such a nice day that we can have our post liturgy celebration right here in this garden. Uh, again, please uh, remember to uh, keep Stephen in your prayers and reach out as often as you can over the next weeks in a special way and let us be a family and a reminder to you all that Tomorrow is the holy feast of Pentecost. Let us go forth in peace, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thank you. So, give us a few minutes and they'll have some uh, nice cool drinks for you and a little snack. And uh, Stephen has asked that you spend some time here and, and uh, he just wants everybody to feel welcome and glad that you could be a part of this. So uh, enjoy the weather and the food and the drinks.